Good morning, friends. Thank you so much for being here with us on this lovely Saturday morning. Uh, now, without further ado, I go straight into introducing our panelists. But really, I don't really have to do much introduction because you know most of them, most about most of them. Uh, Prof Wu. Prof Wu is the reason why we are having this uh, ASEAN Forum on Sustainable Development. He is the head of uh, Vice Presidents of UNSDSN uh, for Asia and also the head of our headquarters here. And economist, uh, very naughty. He has a lot of naughty ideas. You you see that later in his presentation. Yeah. <laughs> Further to my left is Miss Ariel Tan. She was here in Malaysia uh, during Najib's time as as a deputy head of mission at the Singaporean High Commission, and she is now. Senior Fellow and Deputy Head of Policy Study at the S. Raja Ratnan School of International Study, Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. Uh, welcome. She's a very friendly Singaporean from Malaysia. <laughs> Pro Malaysia. Yeah, well, you know that Malaysians and Singaporeans sometimes yes, we like to. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and to my right is uh, Dr. Sri Saifuddin Abdullah, and he would always be very cautious. People do not mix up his last name. Uh, it's just a personal friend to me. I call him bro. I don't use that title. <laughs> but what is important is that he was our former foreign minister twice and former Minister of Communications and Multimedia once, and now Shadow Minister for Education and Higher Education. And uh, he has been active on international affairs even before 2013, at one point uh, the chair of the Global Moderate Movement. Mm -hmm. Further to my right, thank you. <laughs> Further to my right is Prof. Uh, Kwek Cheng Sui um, at UKM. He's Professor of International Relations and Head of ASEAN Study, Asian Studies at the Institute of Malaysian and International Study, ACMAS at UKM. And people in the IR field, you certainly don't need any introduction from me about him. He's a towering figure in the field. Now, so today we're going to talk about geostrategic trends and ASEAN future. And uh, I want to steal something from, from Prop Quick first, right? Can I do that, the three I? Right. Uh, so that's stealing a little bit of his show. He said that ASEAN is three I. It's imperfect, ineffective, but indispensable. So not perfect, but you need it for some reason. Now, we are going to give our panelists 10 minutes each. So at three minutes, we'll see a sign, and then one minute, another sign, and then time's up. And I'll give you at most 30 seconds to one minute to wrap everything up, no matter how much you have to say, because the, the key point is for you to have Q&A. Now, I assure you I won't be the fifth panelist. You're not going to see a super active uh, moderators going in and so on. I'll just basically get them to question each other to answer your questions. And after that, we come to, we come to the Q&A session. You can ask questions, but if you want to give a talk, hold, hold on, wait until everything is finished. The floor is for you out there. Right, but you ask question, I'll give you up to one to two minutes, and uh, so we collect questions and so on. Now, without further ado, I would like to invite Ariel. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me and for their warm hospitality. I'm honored to be part of this distinguished panel 
Apologies for my poor voice as I'm recovering from a cold. My remarks today convey my own views and do not represent my, that of my think tank or my government. The key strategic trends of our times are well publicized, namely the relative rise of China and India and the relative decline of the US and Russia. The consequences include US-China rivalry, closer China-Russia ties, India's non-alignment but closer ties with the West, the active diplomacy of wealthy Gulf states, higher risks of miscalculation and proxy wars, skirmishes at tense borders, and the Taiwan contingency, and economically, higher protectionism and slower tech transfers and innovation. This is testing the statecraft of great and middle powers and small states and the resilience of the multilateral system that sustains a degree of civilized international life for states. The organizations under strain include the UN, EU, NATO, um, SEO, G20, and most importantly, ASEAN. I would argue, however, that deeper generational challenges are being posed by the rapid and under-regulated development of artificial intelligence and digitalization of social exchange and the economy. The race in military spending, nuclear weapons acquisition and space exploration, climate change, loss of biodiversity and environmental degradation, physical, food, water, energy, insecurity, and critical demographic trends, migration, and conflicts. Each of these developments are stressing national populations, political systems, and policymaking, and presenting strategic implications for the global community. Yet, international cooperation on these critical issues have been neglected or complicated by great power rivalry. But media tends to focus on what the, power ca the powerful care about or what most people find entertaining, say, on the US-China cockfight. Even the reporting on ASEAN meetings is dominated by the US-China dynamic, providing a simplistic and wrong frame for ASEAN's efforts to integrate and manage an, a, a Southeast Asia community by engaging a broad array of partners. ASEAN member states are not blameless. Some have found it convenient to blame US-China competition for issues that they in fact have with one another or one of the powers. For instance, in the South China Sea, a significant part of the dispute involves clashes among the claimant states and have nothing to do with US-China competition. This panel on geostrategic trends is spot on in linking these trends to sustainable development. Indeed, sustainable development is what Southeast Asian populations prioritize. It is frankly less important to most, to most ordinary citizens as to who is right or wrong in the invasion of Ukraine. M more important for them is the crushing inflation that the war has produced. So when powers approach ASEAN to seek our political support, Apart from principles and precedent, perhaps ASEAN and the Global South should also be more explicitly considering each issue from the frame of their development priorities. Is this event helpful or not to our priorities? Powers which wish to advance their strategic goals of influence in Southeast Asia should demonstrate that they are net plus actors in supporting our development priorities. At the same time, for ASEAN to effectively address the great powers, it has to be a more integrated social economic entity, serving as a vital net contributor to each member state's development goals. This requires a greater harmonization of rules and standards in areas ranging from agriculture, environment, food safety, data protection, e-commerce to labour movement. Admittedly, it has made strides in these issues, including plans for a regional power grid. Failure to do so will reduce the disincentives for disunity and conflict among its members. Indeed, some observers believe it is more likely than not that ASEAN will be divided, that its members with its members supporting different sides. I am more optimistic. While ASEAN states say that they don't want to be forced to choose, they certainly like to have choices. Observers underestimate the strategic sophistication of Southeast Asians. Historically, the peoples here have witnessed the rise and fall of empires and maintain a degree of agency to thrive among the Siamese and Javanese empires, 
the Chinese tributary system, and the rival European colonial powers. Despite multiple waves of migration and their strong soft power, China and India has not taken over the region. Southeast Asia is neither Chinese nor Indian, but a melange of people with long memories and a penchant for subtle, omnidirectional operations. Recent developments illustrate this. In surveys conducted by ICS, Yusof Ishak and Lowy Institute on regional sentiment, the preference is clearly for a balance of powers. This applies not just to Indonesia and Malaysia, but also Laos. China's growing economic clout and assertiveness in the South China Sea have both encouraged countries here to welcome political relations with China and yet also be more concerned of being dominated and losing their agency. Many have quietly nurtured greater strategic and defence ties with the US and its friends and allies, including the UK, Australia and Japan. India is gradually becoming an option as well. I will not go through the Quad and AUKUS, but I, I suspect that there would be less sensitive players in this region, even if ASEAN still prefer to deal directly bilaterally with the members of these two groupings. Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The Russian-Chinese narrative of the invasion is well publicized and quite popular among quarters in the Global South, including Africa and Southeast Asia, Muslim populations, anti-colonial, old left, pro-China groups. But younger cohorts also see the contest as one between David and Goliath and support the smaller Ukraine. Overall, if indeed big powers are not expected to abide by international law and smaller nations may be attacked by a neighboring big power citing historical claims, then these smaller states would have to seek security guarantors, such as offshore balances. Myanmar, ASEAN should try but has little leverage with which to shape the Myanmar junta's behavior. But ASEAN's carving out of Myanmar's junta political leadership from its gatherings has allowed ASEAN to continue engaging the West. A choice has been made. Decoupling of uh, supply chains, the increased chances of war and slowdown, uh, and slowdown in innovation and inefficiencies in supply chain are negative developments for ASEAN countries. But each is also jostling to host production lines that have been diverted from China to the region. A successful ASEAN strategy towards the great powers could be to make strengthening regional sustainable development a higher priority. This has to include not just food security, digitalization, cyber security, environmental protection and climate change mitigation, but also safety and security, territorial integrity and sovereignty. If ASEAN consistently chooses partners that tangibly support these priorities, this can be a powerful incentive to shape behaviours of powers in the, in the region. This will indeed be a major achievement of ASEAN centrality. So, for instance, the US, China, EU, Japan, India, Australia, each have much to offer ASEAN in terms of investment, trade, technological transfer, administrative expertise, and experience. For instance, in the EU's case, its experience with rules harmonization for sectors ranging from agriculture to e-commerce, which ASEAN can benefit tremendously from. Globally, Indonesia, Malaysia, Vietnam are top countries in reducing the loss of primary forests in 2022. Europe should acknowledge and support such efforts and review punitive measures on palm oil imports, for instance. The El Nino has been declared for 2023-2024, bringing with it severe impact on food secure insecurity, public health, forest fires, haze, and lower tourist receipts, which can lead to political instability and a distracted ASEAN. ASEAN will be focused on mitigating the effects and putting long-term infrastructure in place to deal with these regular occurrences. External partners that seek to engage ASEAN should be pressed more to work with, to work with us on these priorities. I shall stop here. Thank you. As I'm not much of a speaker, what I would do is let you read it and then so that I can sound better than what I actually say. Well, progress of history does not necessarily go smoothly. Well, I'll have two and a half minutes on each of these four 
uh, topics. We are here of hot and sour soup. I think to describe the international situation is that we have a hot and cold situation. We certainly have global warming. There's a threat from the environment. And then we have cold war. What's the growth implications? That's the only thing I'm qualified to speak about because I'm an economist. The growth implications on both of them are negative. <clears throat> For example, climate change would mean that agricultural productivity would definitely decline in existing areas of whatever they grow. So that means that we have to start growing rice further up north or further down south. So that means there is a huge adjustment cost. Perhaps to bring an example that you all can easily think of is that the best champagne in the world used to be produced by the weather, giving the right amount of sugar content to the grapes in Champagne, France. But now the optimal combination of sugar in grapes is in southern England. Champagne companies have moved and buy land there. What we see is an adjustment. Then we have got the situation of a multipolar world, and that has caused a fraying of the global supply chains. The division of labor is threatened, and that's the fundamental observation in economics. Wealth is maximized by the division of labor. If you reduce the division of labor, wealth has to go down. So to quote, uh, the title of a book by Lenin, Jamapan. That is, well, first what to do, we have to think about the, or how the U.S.-China conflict developed. As in everywhere, is, there are multiple lobbies in every country. In the case of the U.S., there is the military and uh, security group that wants to maintain the supremacy of the United States. If you look at, like Jeff Sachs says, the magazine Foreign Affairs, the word is, are we still number one? Are, are, are we the primacy? But they have never been strong enough to set foreign policy unilaterally because there are other groups that have outvoted them traditionally. One big group, the biggest pro-China lobby in the United States are the big business. Used to, used to be big business, high tech and Wall Street and Wall Street. Goldman Sachs and company are the single biggest supporters of free trade with China. And the third group is the people who call themselves real politics like Kissinger. Kissinger's point is the world is so big, why should we fight? Let us work together and bully everyone else. So that has certainly been the Kissinger line, which, but, and, a subsist, and a substantial people agree to that. Group two and three used to dominate policy. But now things have changed. People have left group two and group three to group one. The reason they have joined, moved people from group two to group one would be especially the American banks. When the American, when China joined WTO in 2001, the, what is agreed was China would open up its banking sector within five years. So when 2006 came about, the Americans say, what happened to national treatment for our banks? The Chinese say, wait, wait, it's coming. It didn't come. So they sued China in 2009. And the WTO, as you know, is a very careful organization. So it took them four years to come to a ruling and say, yes, China, you must open. And China said, yes, 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 we are, we are open. And the, Bank of, and the People's Bank of China started drawing up regulations. Up to today, not a single one is in there. So you could see that big money have been disappointed. And they said, well, if you want to go ahead and, con and hit China, go and do it. Similarly, Facebook, Google used to be very confident that they could, would eventually be allowed into China because of their technological prowess. Didn't happen. WhatsApp was certainly better than WeChat at the very beginning, but then now WeChat has become better than WhatsApp. 
So they could see that it is not, it's a future threat. So that's a group two has changed. Group three has also changed, largely because one of China's closest friends is Iran. And Iran is a sworn enemy of the United States. And it was quite inevitable when the heating up of the South China Sea came about, the threat persuaded many people to start switching. So it means that in order to stop the Cold War, you need people to switch back. So how can you get people to switch back? But the point is, such kind of changes in the, in the composition must have also occurred in China. To fight, you need two persons to fight. So if one person switch, if the other person doesn't switch, that's not going to happen. Perhaps the switches in China uh, were partly induced by the US, and would they easily switch back when, if that would happen? Well, what are the, what's the situation in the trade war? The primary weapon of the US is technological restraining, restraint on China, like the high performance chip. So the question is, what is the size of the damage for China? Who else gets damaged? I, it turns out the people who get most damaged are people like the Koreans. So they're very eager. So we did a study together to ex who else do you think are the big people who get damaged? We are assuming that the US is successful in able to stop technological diffusion. If we can make that assumption, this is what we expect to find. It is a lose-lose outcome for everybody because of the reduction in the division of labor, the U.S. is made worse off. And the 10 and 20 up there is the severity of the restraint on technological diffusion. If technological diffusion stopped by 10%, it's lower by 20%. So what do we see are the biggest? Korea, Taiwan lose much more than China and the United States. The other big loser is ASEAN. Basically, we, Korea, Taiwan, and ASEAN, have to tell these guys, stop fighting. You are not just hurting yourself. You are plastering me even more. Okay, what is to be done? I've been told I've got three minutes, so let's skip. And basically, what we have, the continual rise in tensions, is because there are three types of competition interacting with each other trade competition, technological competition, geostrategic competition. Someone acts in area number one, the other person responds in area number two, and the, 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 then the, the counter move is in area number three. That's a spiraling of tensions. So how do you stop the spiraling of tensions? It is to decouple the competition. Don't decouple from each other, decouple the three competition. And when you decouple, the first thing is you've got to talk about what is the instruments for each kind of competition, and then that instrument should be used only for that kind of uh, competition. Does it sound naive? No, I'm going to say it is very workable. Let's show them. That's the next one. Oops, sorry. <laughs> it's me who has to press the next one. <laughs> the first thing is how do you separate uh, national security competition from technology and trade. National security means safety. Safety means that if the other guy attacks me first, he is unlikely to win. That is the definition of safety I want to adopt, such that you can bomb me first, but then you are not going to get victory, just like Japan bombed Pearl Harbor and the Americans did not uh, yield. So if we can guarantee that, then national security is guaranteed. And how do you guarantee that? You've got to deal directly with the problem. This whole thing of trade is an indirect way to affect the capacity of the other side to project power. Why don't you restrain the power right away? Restrain it with arms talks. How far our missiles should be away from each other, how many missiles we should each have. This is exactly what Gorbachev and Reagan agreed to. These are things... We have experts who can uh, measure the disruptive force of every weapon, and we can draw a line on that. 
Let us say this is possible. So then we have removed national security from technology and trade competition. What is technology competition? It really comes down to is how much can a country subsidize its industry that competes with other countries? Basically, it is an argument over what is the use of industrial policy. Industrial policy for a small country is straightforward. If you do something that fail, only you are harmed because it's a small country. You don't impact anybody else. But if you're a big country, if you do something that ultimately fail, you harm yourself and your trading partner. Because during the period of the bad policy, you suppress the world price and the amount of world trade. So the other side suffers. Now, what do we do? In WTO, there is a ban on unfair trading practices. We should similarly have rules on unfair industrial policies. This is what that is needed to decouple technology competition from the other two. That means that what is the point of trade competition? Trade policy is to expand trade. That's what the trade policy instruments should be used for. How do we go about implementing this? Basically, you cannot have two major agreements, arms trade and trade on banning industrial policy, unless people trust each other. The other guy has to do it, right? And how can trust be induced? My suggestion is this is where ASEAN could play a big role. We tell them we need to decarbonize and protect our biodiversity for your good too, not just ours. And we cannot do it because we don't have money, we don't have the, the knowledge. So why don't you guys form a consortium? Korea, Japan, China, United States, and whoever wants to join. I think working together to realize the 17 SDGs and to achieve the 1.5 degree is the package that would allow the big powers to work together and build the trust that would then set the goodwill that will make the signing of the two treaties uh, possible. So I stop here. Thank you very much for your questions. Assalamu alaikum and uh, salam sejahtera. Thank you, Chinwat, uh, members of the panel, brothers and sisters. I sort of agree with uh, almost everything that was alluded to by the two speakers before me, except for Ariel, not sure if the young one really support the Western position on what is happening in Ukraine. I think uh, some young Malaysians don't really follow the Western propaganda. Uh, I would like to deal with three matters. Uh, starting with what kind of world, what kind of geopolitics, if you like, do we really want? What is the challenge? And then the, how is ASEAN within these two points? Uh, I, I believe everyone uh, wants to see a world peace that is real and sustained, uh, world peace that is uh, just and fair. Uh, I come from someone who, who don't really believe in this talks about international world order which come from certain sides of the globe. Uh, and because of that, I subscribe to the importance of a multipolar world. Um, and this is where, uh, like was mentioned by Ariel, regional groupings have a lot of role to play, including ASEAN. And it is the regional groupings that can actually strengthen our understanding of multilateralism. Because until and unless um, 
multilateralism is embraced by all, especially the superpowers, then all of the other international architectures, be it in finance, economics, uh, social frameworks like the SDG, uh, notwithstanding the lobbies, <laughs> as mentioned by my the, the speaker before me, then uh, we will be seeing a lot of, we will be looking and be always subscribed to, uh, or at the mercy of, uh, you know, the superpower place. And this is my second point, which is really the challenge. The background of what was spoken by the two speakers before me has the five superpowers shadow play at the back. And each of the five superpowers have different ways of doing things. There's one superpower who is not really super and not very active at this moment in time. There's another superpower who was not so active sometimes, but uh, becoming a little more active now, more often than not supporting another superpower, which is greater than this superpower. But now also this superpower is uh, being more interested in ASEAN, uh, more than before, because before this superpower belongs to a regional grouping that is probably bigger than ASEAN. There's another superpower that for whatever history that we know has always been at war with so many people, but never win the war, including one in Southeast Asia. And is behaving like uh, a world police and trying to force its hegemony over everyone else, including the other four superpowers. There's another superpower who is willing to go to war to defend her territory if someone either provoke or unprovokedly were to uh, enter into her territory of influence. And then there's the fifth superpower who do not have a history of going to war. Uh, and is only interested in trying to get her rightful place as a superpower. And try to a certain level to decouple her trade and technology from a geopolitics. Though I would rather use threats to geopolitics. Geopolitics is really a sugar coating for threats. Come on lah, we all know what's happening. Yeah? But in academic world, sometimes in diplomacy, we use the term geopolitics. It's actually threats. So it's a world uh, living in three T's, Professor Quet. You have the three I's, okay? The three T's, which is trade, technology, and threats. Um, I agree with uh, the challenges that was outlined earlier, but I want to add one to yours, uh, Ariel. Uh, you, I think you mentioned in passing uh, this is about internet governance. Uh, this is the new battle. Um, since 2015, the United Nations has formed a government, a group of government experts on trying to look at how do we uh, govern internet. I think they use a term, if I'm not mistaken, is uh, uh, how member states behave or something to that effect. I think the DG of IDFR can correct me if my, if my <laughs> uh, terms is, is, is incorrect. Then China came up with a 10 point. Wang Yi, uh, the foreign minister of all people, who is now uh, being a, a promoted as the most senior advisor to the president uh, in as far as foreign policy is concerned, came up with a 10 point uh, 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 what you call counter proposal to the to the to the United Nations uh, uh, framework or proposed framework on how do we govern uh, internet? Uh, I must put a caveat. I don't think the UN used the word govern. I'm, I'm just using the word govern uh, to to make things uh, easier. But the, this is the new battle. Uh, we see some of the battle uh, when 
uh, some quarters try to ban Huawei or or try to block uh, WeChat and and things like that. Yeah, and the latest debate is of course uh, on uh, Twitter versus what's the new one? Huh? Threats. Yeah. Now, where is ASEAN in all of this? I think in as far as fulfilling its main objective, ASEAN has been very successful. Uh, we have had relatively a very peaceful region uh, in this part of the world. No war, no, no nothing. And we, we have been, uh, as, as, uh, as a region, as a grouping, we have been quite... Um, uh, successful in applying this international relations, uh, what do you call, uh, uh, strategy called hedging. Professor Craig, you wrote about hedging quite a bit. In trying to choose who do we want to be friendly with, in which area and when. So we are quite pragmatic and, and I think ASEAN should continue doing it. But uh, it is also very important that ASEAN strengthens its intra-trade. I think our intra-trade is still one thing. Uh, we have to do uh, much more. What is the test for ASEAN? And does this test relate to my first and my second point? It's Myanmar. Myanmar is a, well, I wouldn't like, maybe I can use the word classic. It's a classic example of how ASEAN is trying to navigate uh, her relations with the superpowers, in particular the US and China. Um, we are trapped in our own charter, which is uh, non-interference, but I have uh, used the term when I was foreign minister that we should also consider non-indifference. Uh, we should uh, in, the, in the context of Myanmar, try to, yes, try to implement the five-point consensus, but with a framework that has a clear end game, which is pro-people, that ASEAN should uh, start officially, uh, or if not officially, openly uh, engaging the NUG, the NUCC, and the other stakeholders. But to date, there are only three ASEAN member states who have either openly declared that we have engaged or at least have openly said that we should engage. And that's Indonesia, Malaysia, and Singapore. And that is interesting. That's ASEAN within ASEAN hedging. Uh, you know, uh, how do we deal with uh, the superpowers uh, when trying to solve the crisis in Myanmar? So I will leave you with that. Thank you. Selamat pagi. A very good morning to uh, everyone. Uh, first of all, uh, let me thank the organizers, uh, particularly uh, Chin Huat and also uh, Professor Wu for having me here. Such a pleasure to join this uh, distinguished group of uh, panelists um, uh, this morning. And I look around uh, the room, I'm very glad to see uh, many familiar faces and also uh, friends like uh, DG Shah, Azizi, and also uh, my good friend Professor uh, Pupet Arif. So, um, and um, pleasure to be here. So what I'm going to do uh, is that uh, let me be uh, uh, to do uh, what uh, YB Saifuddin uh, has just done and also uh, earlier, uh, earlier panelists as well. Three points, right? So I'll have uh, three points to uh, present a Malaysian or Southeast Asian perspective of uh, how geopolitical strategic uh, 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 trends uh, affect uh, ASEAN uh, and also Southeast Asian countries uh, as a group. So the three points are manifestations, implications, and also options. So uh, meaning I'm going to uh, unpack uh, uh, how geopolitical uh, trends uh, manifest in Southeast Asia, how uh, it affects uh, Malaysia and also uh, other fellow ASEAN members, and also uh, what are the options uh, for ASEAN uh, countries. So first thing first, and I'm so glad for uh, uh, that uh, Ariel and also Professor Wu and uh, uh, YB uh, has, have already 
elaborated a lot of points. So I guess uh, they will save uh, my time. I will just uh, highlight a few uh, uh, dimensions that are quite uh, prominent, important for from an IR uh, uh, student of a geopolitics perspective. So as I uh, mentioned, uh, highlighted by uh, virtually all uh, uh, panelists before me, US-China rivalry uh, is a big thing that uh, affects uh, almost everything uh, and uh, in every uh, domains. So uh, what uh, have to be uh, highlighted is that uh, for Southeast Asian countries, Malaysia included, this US-China rivalry is not entirely new. As victims of centuries-long colonizations and also uh, victims of a decades-long co-op politics, the current US-China rivalry is uh, the latest round of uh, big power geopolitical rivalry. It's uh, in the DNA of all big powers to compete. So what we are seeing is not the first, it's not uh, going to be the last. So Southeast Asia realized that, but there are new dimensions uh, in the sense that uh, the current competition between uh, Washington and Beijing, they are not just competing on military ground, but also uh, non-military non ground. Professor Wu's uh, uh, excellent presentation, I think, uh, highlighted a number of uh, examples. US, uh, China trade, so on and so forth, and also ongoing uh, supply chain uh, competition, technologically uh, decoupling, so on and so forth, are the examples. And examples of these uh, military and non-military competitions between US and China only uh, increase uh, by days. So that's uh, certainly the key point that we need to uh, uh, remember when we talk about US-China rivalry. And current geopolitical trends is mainly about US-China rivalry, but not just only about US and China. There are other big powers, the so-called uh, second tier powers, that are very much uh, part and parcel of the process. And uh, let's not assume that uh, the other second tier powers are also uh, on the one side against the other. There are lots of overlapping convergence, but clearly there are some uh, divergences as well. One good example uh, would be uh, the word that uh, Professor Wu mentioned a number of times, decoupling. And we have uh, seen in recent months, uh, over the last few months, including uh, US uh, allies and partners, including those in uh, Europe, strong long-standing partners and allies, they are also uncomfortable with the uh, feasibility and also desirability of uh, decoupling. So much so European leaders are the one who push for the so-called notion of de-risking. Something that uh, I think many in South Asia are still trying to uh, observe, but that's an uh, indicator and evidence of uh, second tier powers those in Europe and also the so-called members of a Quad, as the area mentioned, are clearly a part and parcel of the key powers uh, and also a player in the ongoing uh, geopolitical uh, trends. And the second tier powers are growing activism, like an extension of uh, the US-China rivalry, also manifest not just in a military aspect, Fon Op, South China Sea, Taiwan Strait, but also non-military, primarily economic, development, supply chain, technological, so on and so forth. So all these uh, examples are basically new initiatives put forward by second tier powers to be the so-called alternative to China's uh, Belt and Road, and uh, we are seeing the competition ongoing. Along all these uh, back, uh, backdrop and also ongoing development is the so-called shift from Asia-Pacific to the Indo-Pacific. When the first, uh, first time uh, when the word uh, Indo-Pacific was proposed very much by uh, the proponent members of uh, Quad, I think ASEAN countries are generally very uh, uh, nervous and uh, it was a big dilemma in the sense that uh, some of us in the region uh, see the word Indo-Pacific as the uh, code word for containment, as a code word for anti-China. Many tried to uh, keep distance. But 2019 uh, was a critical point in the sense that ASEAN uh, took the initiative of coming up with our own version of uh, AOIP, right? ASEAN Outlook on the Indo-Pacific, which uh, witnessed that uh, some countries begin to use uh, the word uh, Indo-Pacific, but primarily in the context of AOIP, ASEAN Outlook on the Indo-Pacific, to make distinctions uh, between uh, our version, Southeast Asia version, and also the Quad version of uh, Indo-Pacific. Um, and uh, let, which leads me to uh, the second uh, point that I would like to uh, share. Again, I have uh, three points here. And um, implications manifest in many ways. And uh, we can uh, highlight three, uh, which you could see is quite a mix, ambivalent, both positive, but also uh, negative. Things that we are happy about, things that we are getting uh, more and more nervous. Let's uh, talk about good news. I think clearly there are benefits. Yeah? US-China trade war and the ongoing uh, US-China uh, competition in military and non-military aspect 
does uh, bring about some benefits, especially uh, we saw uh, some uh, so-called us, the China plus one strategy has uh, resulted in uh, some movements of economic activities out of China, coming to other parts, primarily Southeast Asia, Vietnam primarily, but also uh, Malaysia and other countries. So Southeast Asia is becoming a center of courtships. Big powers in and out of region uh, are trying to uh, court and also uh, get uh, uh, my, uh, support and also friendship from Southeast Asia, want to uh, build on a larger partnership. So this converge, we all converge uh, on the uh, main goal of uh, diversification. Nobody, no country want to put all eggs in anyone's uh, basket, either economic basket or, ec or strategic uh, basket. So these are, in a way, uh, bringing uh, lots of benefits uh, in multiple ways, but uh, we say that there is no free lunch. When you get something, be prepared also uh, to face uh, come consequences or economics will say uh, trade-off. Yeah? So there are trade-offs uh, in the form of risk and also uh, dilemmas. There are lots of uh, risks uh, uh, both for military and also a non-military aspect. Militarily, of course, we are worrying about the uh, entrapment. When big elephants are fighting, smaller uh, animals are worried will be entrapped uh, in between. And it is not just military uh, consequences, there are other economic consequences as well. The ongoing economic and technological bifurcation, we know that will not stop in economic. It will spill over to strategic and eventually big powers are going to uh, ask us, which side are you with? So that creates some kind of a dilemma for all of us. Let me say all of us, uh, not just uh, in Southeast Asia, but also beyond. And there are big uh, indicators uh, that indicates uh, the ongoing dilemma is not over, is not going to uh, over anytime soon. Whether or not uh, uh, we are going to see a new uh, uh, president in the White House uh, next year, these dilemmas, the competition were ongoing. So the dilemma is that countries in Southeast Asia want to constrain but not contain uh, China. There is a distinction in the sense that as smaller countries, you do welcome some balance of power to constrain a rising power in geographical proximity. But you know that there is a thin line between constrainment and containment, which is why many are keeping a distance from uh, some of the uh, Quad and uh, Indo-Pacific initiative. Primarily, we welcome constrainment opportunity, but not the possibility that will lead to a uh, containment. We want diversification, we do not want decoupling, we do not think uh, that is possible, and we are a bit uh, skeptical, uh, like YB uh, mentioned. Whenever big powers, mainstream uh, analysts uh, talk about rules-based order, like-minded and de-risking, Southeast Asia have our own uh, interpretation. So in the remaining uh, minutes that I have, let me very quickly uh, turn to the third and also uh, my final uh, point. Um, and uh, you, it's uh, about the options, right? So options, like in uh, many other things uh, in life, there are multiple. But there are some options that you know is a non-starter. The non-starter option clearly is that we side with uh, one against the other. Southeast Asia have long decided is we are not indecisive. We are not a uh, kind of uh, hesitation and all that. We have uh, made our own decision. We have made our own decisions that our choice is to make a choice among any of the competing powers. And then, uh, so this is the first uh, kind of uh, distinctive, instinctive uh, principle and also behavior that uh, Southeast Asia already internalized. It's in the smaller states, the DNA, to have these three behavioral tendency and this tendency have manifested, continue in many, many ways, both militarily, but also uh, strategically and economically. So to cut the long uh, conceptual uh, issues uh, short, I'm talking about hedging without using the word hedging. So hedging, uh, like uh, YB uh, mentioned earlier on, there are three uh, elements, there are three defining elements. You see all three, you know that some hedging behavior is ongoing. And let's bear in mind that the uh, hedging is a policy without pronouncement. All policy, you need to announce. You need to pronounce. Hedging, you don't pronounce. Because once you pronounce, hey, I'm hedging, then I think it defeats the purposes, right? But when you see these three uh, indicators and three evidence, you know that someone is hedging. And it's not just in Southeast Asia, but also beyond. First, of course, it's about neutrality, meaning not taking sides. But you are not just uh, saying that you are taking side, not taking sides uh, passively or reactively. It has to be active. Hedging is different from neutrality in the sense that hedging is an active uh, form. You need to take initiative. And it's not just about active neutrality, it is also about diversification. You need to diversify economically and also diversify strategically. And you need to do that 
inclusively. Meaning that if you are just diversifying uh, your options, strategic options within one camp, rather than both or all camps, that is not hedging. It has to be inclusive. Finally, finally, it's about fallback. We use the fallback uh, all the time, right? And uh, in layman term, fallback means that it's a human instinct. We, in all occasions, under high stakes, high risk, we will have the instinctive uh, behavior of what if, or just in case, right? Not just in time, but just in case. What if uh, China become even more assertive? What if uh, US commitment uh, become uncertain uh, beyond a certain year? What if uh, the economic that we are seeing stop and uh, become a problematic? What if the second tier of powers activism might not necessarily bring us a benefit, but also a more problematic? And therefore, it's instinctive. And that is my final point. It's an instinctive uh, for all countries as rational actors to try to uh, keep options open as much as possible. Some contingency, some strategic options have been uh, played out on a daily and weekly uh, issues. I will stop here and look forward uh, to your questions and so uh, comments. Thank you. I want to invite first round of questions. Introduce yourself, your institution, your question, and who do you want to point that question? Okay, hello, hi, my name is Ely. I'm a PhD student from ICMAS. So I have uh, one, two questions, actually. The first question I would like to direct to Professor Wu. Um, previously, you were talking about countries working together to form an equal power with the superpower. What if we create claimant states joint authority between claimant state in South China Sea, is it possible? And for the second questions, I would like to direct to YB Datuk Sri Saifuddin. Um, in your opinion, do you think that the claimant state joint authority is an appropriate approach for Malaysia and the involved countries in creating peaceful coexistence in South China Sea? Thank you. Hi, uh, good morning everyone. I'm Anis, a master's student from Northern University, Malaysia. So uh, my question is directly to YB Datuk Saifuddin Abdullah. What are your hopes, uh, especially in Malaysia's governance, to promote the country through public diplomacy with ASEAN? Thank you. Hey, good morning. My name is Shekhar. I don't belong to any particular organization. I'm just an indi indi individual. Uh, my question relates to all the panelists and just drawing from the various comments made so far this morning. My question is, um, how does ASEAN as a grouping have a stronger voice? In the sense that uh, my, my perception is that there are so many economic and political groupings out there and you know, BRICS is another one that's uh, emerging uh, and becoming more prominent now. I think it was mentioned earlier in one of the presentations that you know, ASEAN has done pretty well for itself, fairly peaceful, um, you know, going about its business, trying to develop its individual and collective goals. Um, and that's probably a good thing. But how does ASEAN going forward have a stronger voice on the world stage? Because my perception, and I may be wrong, is that ASEAN is kind of fairly quiet in that sense. We hear a lot from the various other groupings, but I don't seem to see or hear a lot that's coming out from ASEAN as a strong economic and political grouping. That's my question. Thank you. I'm Ravi from HELP University. Now, I will, in the context of sustainable, sustainable development, enforce, uh, implementation and enforcement is critical. And uh, one of the uh, points that we need to look at is uh, the ASEAN policy of non-interference. Now, I just feel that it may be uh, uh, a sore point in the process of enforcement, simply because, um, for example, in the case of Laos and its uh, aggressive development of uh, building of dams, and currently there are about 70 dams in operation in Laos and uh, 30 are under construction and they have got plans to build another 200 dams. Now this is actually affecting uh, the ecological uh, uh, environment of the Delta, the, the Mekong Delta. Now, um, of course, uh, Laos has its own reasons. Uh, being a landlocked country, uh, it is critical for them to look at um, any uh, contributing factor in their, <coughs> in the, in their, towards their GDP. 
So how can ASEAN, with a non-interference uh, policy, uh, uh, engage in, 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 in the process of implementing and, and enforcing sustainable development? Thank you. Thank you so much for all the questions asked. I would like to invite our panelists to respond to the questions. Uh, we have two, three questions that specifically point to the three and also uh, Prof Wu, the rest are open. Also that if you have anything to respond to each other. So I'll start with uh, the three first. Everyone would get up to four minutes so we can have a second round. Um, on the claimant states story, I think the challenge is really to get ASEAN, on the, all of the 10 ASEAN member states to agree because you are now talking about uh, not all of the 10 ASEAN member states. And normally, we always, fall, we always go back to the notion about ASEAN centrality. All 10 has to agree. So that would be uh, where, where we should start. Yeah? So it's not about yes or no. It's really about uh, uh, the ASEAN centrality. Plus, uh, whenever we deal on claimant states, the understanding is, again, we do not do it unilaterally. Uh, you may do it quietly, but you never uh, announce it. So you don't have uh, Malaysia, China unilaterally uh, trying to deal with uh, Beteng Patinggi Ali. It's done within uh, ASEAN uh, centrality or the concept of ASEAN centrality. Uh, on our public diplomacy, I suppose this is something that we really need to do more. Um, and by, by more, I, I give you two examples. One, I think, uh, I mean, as far as Malaysia is concerned, the University Students Exchange, uh, which started during Khalid Nordin's time when he was Minister of uh, Higher Education, I believe it is still ongoing. We, need, we really need to strengthen that and, and, and do it real. Uh, all the other exchanges, uh, sports and whatnot, those are touch and go kind of thing. But university students exchange is real. You stay in one ASEAN country for one semester. You study with people in that country and students from other ASEAN countries. Interestingly for ASEAN, the most successful ASEAN youth program ever and still going is not made in ASEAN, but it's made in Tokyo the Nippon Maru uh, program, where about 30 ASEAN youth leaders uh, go on board of a ship for those days, three months, now only one month, and go and visit. So they, they, they make a port of call, uh, call of, yeah, they, 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 what's the English word for it? I'm so rusty. Uh, they, they, they visit all <laughs> uh, 10 ASEAN member states. Yeah, I think they also fall in love uh, along the way, <laughs> which is good. The current challenge, number two, is again Myanmar. Uh, how is ASEAN using people-to-people -people engagement? Uh, not, not so many, not, not, not too much, I think. We should really you know, get, well, the NGOs are doing among themselves, but uh, do ASEAN people really understand how the people of Myanmar is suffering, for example? Just look at the xenophobic, view of late among Malaysians on the Rohingyas in Malaysia. Uh, that, that explains uh, you know, how, how more needs to be done. ASEAN leadership, I suppose we need to really strengthen. You, you, you can't be loud unless you are strong. And uh, one of those strengths that is still missing is the economic cohesiveness, uh, the one that I was referring to as the intra uh, ASEAN intra-trade. Non-interference, very quickly, to strengthen our intra-ASEAN economic uh, programs, remember there was this uh, many, many years ago, um, we used to discuss on uh, ASEAN coming up with ASEAN economic projects. There were three or four uh, pilots, but never, not very successful. I think the understanding was at least three ASEAN member states has to be on board on a, on a project so that the project can be called an ASEAN project. And then uh, in dealing with difficult questions, there was this idea about 10 minus X. If you cannot get a consensus, because consensus is very difficult to get, 
or you can get consensus on agreement, but you cannot get the consensus uh, after that <laughs> in, in, in the implementation. So there was this idea about 10 minus X. Then the debate is about who, uh, what is X? And until today, we have not get the answer about what is X. So it's still uh, not there. Thank you. <laughs> Prof. <clears throat> Consensus is very hard to achieve. And so, but there's no need to say that all of us must act together. A group of us will go ahead and act. And I think that X is five. It's the original five ASEAN countries. If Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia, and the Philippines or Brunei? Singapore. Oh, Singapore. Singapore. <laughs> well, I'm very pro-Singapore, <laughs> just like she's pro-Malaysia. The thing is, if this were to move ahead on any initiative, the rest would not hold you back. So I think that this whole thing of ASEAN consensus is an excuse of that the five core members could not agree among themselves to move together. Talk about how uh, ASEAN bigger voice, that certainly is ASEAN uh, cohesiveness. Cohesiveness because we are under common threat. In other words, the reason why I don't kill you today is because there's someone else who will kill both of us. And so I think that is the ultimate uh, vehicle of cohesiveness. And the truth is, what is the danger of the Cold War is not the splitting of ASEAN, different members in different groups. The more likely in the scenario is the splitting of a country into different groups. Different, it's just like the color revolution. Different groups get financed by different parties. That is much more likely than breaking a, a country taking a clear stand on either side. On the question of uh, claimants in the South China Sea, let's ask ourselves, the nine dash line, originally 11, was drawn up in the last days of the Kuomintang regime when it was trying to play hero. So why should the Communist Party of China pick up something of a defeated group of people? What, it, why, and after all, you can de facto have uh, your navy patrolling it for an extent you want. I think that we have to realize in a nuclear age, the ultimate safety is mutual deterrence. Mutual deterrence means you must have second strike capability. If you are struck and all your land missiles are gone, you got to be able to shoot back from the middle of the Pacific at the other person. China does not yet have second strike capability. And how can China get that? When China is able to get submarines that are very quiet, they cannot go out through the East China Sea because the sea is so narrow. The Japanese, Koreans, and Americans will just see the Chinese submarine there to reach the trenches of the Pacific, Southeast Asia is the route. So it is not that they are particularly interested in claiming the area. They want to claim the ability to move nuclear submarines to the trenches of the Pacific as a second strike capability. Should China be denied the right of second strike capability that the Soviet Union and the Americans have? That is the big question in this. What the, uh, and why do we have nuclear power submarines by Australia without them being nuclear weaponized? They make it very clear that we know nuclear weapons on these nuclear submarines. Why? Because then they can follow the Chinese submarines as it moves into the Pacific trenches. So I think there are no easy answers. The best answer is that if there's asymmetric unity, we can say we will take care of the neutrality of movements within the area. 
You don't worry. If your submarines want to go, it's not a threat. Go ahead and do it. It's just like the Straits of Malacca. Why don't we internationalize the Straits of Malacca? Because Malaysia and Indonesia and Singapore could take care of it, ensure the safety from piracy and so forth. So that's what we hope that would be an acceptable option to the big powers. One, trying to prevent the other from having second strike capability. Thank you. So we are the second best to the both powers. area. over to you. Thank you. Um, I think I'll address uh, Mr. Shaker's question about uh, why is it that ASEAN doesn't have a bigger, stronger voice. I think um, if you ask ASEAN, I don't think that that is a top priority for ASEAN to have a stronger voice in international relations in the sense that we believe, um, so, so the original objectives is to bring countries together so that we don't go to wars with each other, we survive the Cold War, we, um, in, and then currently, the, the, the bigger objectives are things like integration community, um, uh, integration of the community, and <clears throat> achieving sustainable development goals that the, the member states want to have. Having a stronger voice on the international stage um, as a former diplomat, I think, um, you know, having a voice in its, on its own is, is, that's, uh, is useless. It's what you can do to back up that voice. And that's what we are trying to develop. You know, you have to be integrated. You have to be able to project your resources. There's no point saying, please, Ukraine and Russia, stop fighting. Yeah, you can say it, but nobody is going to pay any attention to you. So having a stronger voice, you know, is, is maybe a good to have, but it's not really the focus of the organization. Um, I, I, I really um, agree with, um, YB Saifuddin on um, you know bringing the um, the citizens of ASEAN countries together. I um, I didn't talk about this during my presentation. I think there can be geostrategic uh, value in ASEAN developing a true identity and that kind of identity that stand for certain values such as what Dr. Quick uh, was talking about. Really a, a, a very active neutrality, non-alignment. But at the same time, you know, ensuring that we stand for bringing powers together, we stand for objecting to, you know, pointless wars and and um, aggression, violence that do not support sustainable development, and and this identity is not something that is really truly being developed. I think among the populations, some of the smaller and I would say less developed ASEAN countries. Ironically, I think identify more with the ASEAN identity. I think countries like South uh, Singapore and Malaysia maybe less so. So you know that is a good project to develop, and and with and and it's a chicken and egg thing. You can't have ASEAN identity unless you feel a sense of integration with the region, right? In terms of norms, when you go to another country, you can use the you can use the phones, you can use you know what you're getting when you get organic food. When you know, so all these um, standardization, you know, uh, having common norms. These are the things which ASEAN does is working on, but it's very quiet. It's very boring. It's not. It's mind numbing. If you go to any ASEAN meeting, I guarantee you, you'll fall asleep. Even though, even though, <laughs> it's, yeah, you know. So. Um, you know, these are quiet things that ASEAN is doing, it's boring, but I can tell you that diplomats of ASEAN truly benefit from it. I can drop, I can, I can drop myself in Cuba and I will find fellow ASEAN diplomats. And when we have an issue, we straight away get into a habit and a culture of consulting and developing statements that we can present as ASEAN. That's not something to sniff at because you don't get that with other regions, apart from maybe the EU. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ariel. Now, over to you. Thanks very much. And uh, let me begin by uh, uh, referring back to uh, where uh, uh, Ariel mentioned, right? She mentioned uh, integration of community. And I thought that that is actually a good response to, uh, uh, for me to respond and relate to uh, the issues uh, raised by Shikra and also uh, Ravi. So I would add that uh, uh, ASEAN and ASEAN uh, stories uh, is really about uh, integration of community, although I would like to uh, rephrase uh, community to communities, so it's plural. And uh, this diagram concentrates, so, so I think illustrates uh, very well. And from this diagram, uh, you could also see that uh, ASEAN is also a 3B uh, 
uh, story, right? Not just three I uh, as a Jin Hua uh, was very kind to uh, mention earlier on. So three B in the sense that yeah, sometimes can be boring. I think that was uh, Ariel's uh, word, and I would like to say to say that yeah, at the boring at the same time, but sometimes also brilliant and also uh, beautiful, right? Brilliant uh, in what sense? Brilliant in the sense that uh, ASEAN really has become an indispensable entity. The third the I that uh, Jin Hua mentioned earlier on. Where else can you get uh, around the group, right? You, uh, where else can you get uh, a group of smaller, weaker countries? That's just a reality. Manage to uh, attract many sets of stronger powers near and far. Come to uh, Southeast Asia and do some business interactions with us every year. Whatever US-China uh, problem uh, go on, you know that. Every year, every uh, now and then, depending on the levels, they will come to Southeast Asia. ASEAN countries uh, take turn to rotate and also uh, organize uh, events, right? So even at the harder uh, time, right, for example, a uh, pandemic period, pandemic years, it was uh, always uh, almost uh, all bad news, right? But you do see uh, and hear uh, some good news uh, happening even during pandemic time, thanks to uh, ASEAN's uh, story. Some mainstream analysts have been uh, not very kind by criticizing uh, ASEAN is no other than uh, talk shop, and uh, I disagree. I think uh, sometimes uh, talk talk is better than war war, right? And during the pandemic time, uh, you do uh, witness the creation of uh, RCEP, RCEP, Regional Comprehensive Economic uh, Grouping, uh, Comprehensive Partnership, uh, that involve uh, 15 countries. It's very much uh, the EAS, uh, the big, uh, the central uh, circle that you are seeing, minus uh, India. India is not ready, so uh, India decided not to join uh, RCEP. But again, let's uh, emphasize and let's uh, give due credits to uh, ASEAN, right? They have done a beautiful and brilliant job by uh, bringing all those very diverse uh, countries uh, together. Northeast Asian economic powerhouses, there are big giants uh, in economic aspect. But for political and geopolitical reasons, they have been spending decades uh, trying to uh, promote economic cooperation among themselves, integration, not possible. But ASEAN, the talk shop, uh, make it uh, possible and stories uh, continue. So ASEAN in that sense uh, is brilliant and beautiful, indispensable, not just uh, uh, because of uh, um, ASEAN uh, uh, itself, but because of this uh, concentric circle of uh, institutionalized cooperation. So the final, final point uh, that I would like to, uh, uh, given I think one minute that I have, is that uh, last week I co-hosted, uh, we co-hosted an uh, international workshop, and uh, we had the privilege of uh, having Tan Sri Jao Ha and Tan Sri uh, um, um, uh, Said Hamid, uh, and also Pak Rizal from Indonesia uh, as the speakers for the concluding uh, session. And uh, Tan Sri Jao Ha did a brilliant uh, job by uh, coming up with Three, uh, three A's, right? Three A's. Actionable ASEAN agency. With all the flaws and limitations that will not go away, but still, ASEAN as a regional grouping uh, has uh, demonstrated high level of uh, agency, an actionable one. And uh, agency uh, in uh, three I's. Inclination, initiation, and also insistence for the weaker parts to... Uh, try to make our own choices rather than being pushed around by the bigger countries, stronger powers, and uh, being pressured upon. I think there have been a lot of uh, examples that was demonstrated uh, by uh, Professor Wu and also uh, YB and Ariel. So I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you. So you know ASEAN has two sets of three I's, one set of three B's, another three A. So if you want to learn international relations, you should know how to use alphabets and count so that's okay i want to invite i promise you the second round but given the limit of time we can only go one so one question last question sorry <laughs> i'm rosaini a phd candidate in political science at uh, iium gomba i have a very short question really what do the people of asean think about asean thank you um, one of the charges uh, that is brought against ASEAN is that it's highly combustible. That's, uh, it means that the internal politics is about to tear it apart. But leaving the micro level uh, aside, uh, macro level, ASEAN doesn't need to speak in one voice, and I agree with Professor Wu. But on what issues, one, uh, one issue per person perhaps, what issue is it imperative for ASEAN to speak in one voice? 
Thank, Thank you. you. Now, let me just respond to uh, uh, the question by my good friend, uh, uh, Dato DJ Shahs. In what uh, instances that ASEAN must uh, speak in one voice, especially at the macro level? I, I would think uh, there is uh, one particular issue that we do need to strengthen our unity and cohesion. That would be uh, to resist uh, and also cr at the same time create space vis-a-vis -vis, uh, growing big power pressure for us to uh, take a side uh, one over the other. We need to uh, express in one voice that uh, ASEAN's uh, tendency of inclusive diversification, active neutrality, and uh, for, for cultivation of fallback position are actually good not just for ASEAN countries, but good for all of everybody, including especially the competing powers. Because if we start to uh, take side with one uh, power over the other, the other power will do the same. And that would be uh, not just the end of uh, ASEAN cohesion and ASEAN unity, it will be at uh, the end of uh, decades long regional stability that we have, uh, all of us have been benefited for so long. Uh, thank you, DG. Uh, one voice, no, I agree with Professor Quick. It's about the ASEAN Charter that we are trying to review and strengthen because that is the framework for the framework for uh, the ASEAN centrality and ASEAN cohesiveness. Uh, timeline 2015. Not because Malaysia is going to be the chair again, but 2015. We, we ASEAN has this habit of every 10 years, we will then come up with our new 10-year uh, plan of action. So 2015 is the year um, where the new, uh, I don't know what uh, we, we will call it, but already uh, teams have been assembled and teams have been working hard uh, to come up with the new 10-year uh, plan. So on, it's actually on politics and security. That would be uh, the primary uh, issue that we all have to speak uh, in one voice, even though with different different songs, probably different accent, different accent, different song, but we all have to decide. Lah, if it is a love song, it's all love song. <laughs> Never mind in which language. Yeah, thank you. I think the one theme is peace, and to be enforced aggressively through the United Nations process. We need to have someone like Dash Hammershock again, where he's able to stood up to the biggest powers of his days and impose peacekeeping around the world. Um, <clears throat> I agree uh, for Datok's uh, question on uh, what we should um, have a common voice on. I agree with the rest of the speakers. Um, and also the role of, I think, um, <clears throat> external players in the region for ASEAN. The truth is, you know, actually mm, the beauty of ASEAN is you can have an ASEAN position. And then ASEAN member states also play their secondary, second layer, second level games, you know. So it allows ASEAN actually to be actually a bit more flexible in a sense. So, so ASEAN has one common de denominator position. It tends to be very boring and innocuous, like, you know, don't fight wars. And then you have various countries which veer sometimes, I mean, sometimes shift a bit more to one side and the other side. And that allows the vehicle to carry on, you see. Um, that is that kind of flexibility that you um, people may not notice, but it allows the members some breathing space, so that you know the ASEAN position isn't just the only position you need to take. Um, as for the the um, question um, on what ASEAN people think about ASEAN, I would think not very much to be very frank, because I think in uh, among in the countries. ASEAN is about ASEAN meetings, ASEAN leaders holding hands, doing the funny hand holding. Uh, funny clothes. Yeah, funny clothes, funny you know. Clothes. And regularly there will be some media coverage about what does it have to do with me? And how you make, how do you bring that to the people is when you, you can see that traveling is cheaper, more um, cheaper, easy, faster for countries in ASEAN. When you have an ASEAN lane, which actually was proposed uh, at airports, when 
you know, when you think about working overseas, you first think about working in ASEAN. Oh, we can come to Singapore. You know, the working uh, barriers are not as high. We, uh, the, the qualifications, Singapore companies will know my universities. If all these norms and standardizations are there, then, you know, you naturally think about ASEAN when you think about, you know, charting your, your, your life's future. Schooling, you know, naturally it should be on um, universities. Okay, time's up. Thank you. I want to thank DG Shah for asking such a brilliant questions that we just use that to round up our discussion. And please join me to give a round a big hand to our fantastic, insightful, no, insightful, impressive, and what else? You see, that's why I cannot. Uh, that, no, three I. So that's why you know that Prof Wu and I cannot be in the IR field. Thank you.